This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. The Al-Qassam Brigades, the military wing of Hamas, threatened it would not extend the current state of calm if Israel continues its breaches and does not commit to the agreement. Meanwhile, the Palestinians held a funeral procession for a member of Al-Quds Brigades, the military wing of the Islamic Jihad movement. The martyr Ghassan Taramsi fell during an Israeli raid on northern Gaza. Meanwhile, the occupation forces continued to close the crossings into Gaza. I will carry my soul on the palm of my hand and toss it in the battlefields, either a life pleasing to the friend or a sure death outraging the enemy. God is great. The situation on the ground in Gaza is gradually deteriorating. The state of calm is vanishing and escalation is resurfacing. Those people came out in an angry funeral procession for a member of Al-Quds Brigades, the military wing of Islamic Jihad movement. The martyr fell in the most recent Israeli air raids on northern Gaza. We will respond twofold, God permitting. We will respond for all our leaders in the Islamic Jihad movement. We will not stop launching rockets even if we are slaughtered over a rock. Palestinian rockets continued to be launched from the Gaza Strip and Palestinian factions promised to intensify them. Meanwhile, Israel continued closing the commercial crossings with the Gaza Strip. These developments cast their shadow on the future of calm, leaving Palestinians anticipating the worst. The allocated time for calm is nearing its end. We will not extend the calm since the occupation has not committed all of its promises. At the top of the list is ending the siege and opening the crossing points. But the enemy continue to ignore this. If the border crossings remain closed and the siege continues, then there is no room to discuss extending the calm. The escalation was accompanied by campaigns to support Palestinian dialogue and renew cohesion. Representatives from social sectors, religious leaders and independents launched a civil campaign to support the upcoming dialogue in Cairo. Those people remained on strike inside a tent in the heart of Gaza to call on the Palestinian rivals to reach a national agreement. This tent will send telegrams to the dialogue participants. We have spoken with all sides to prepare the grounds for dialogue and end the Palestinian division and return to agreement and national unity. According to Palestinian citizens, the success of internal dialogue is the real and most effective guarantee to face the escalation and current challenges, regardless of international changes or Israeli intentions. Tamar al-Mish'al, Al-Jazeera, Gaza, Palestine. أكد السيد فاروق الشرع نائب رئيس الجمهورية موقف سوريا الثابتة تجاه القضية الفلسطينية Syrian Vice President Farouk al-Sharat said that Syria's position towards the Palestinian plight will not change. He stressed the importance of Palestinian national unity and the need for coordinating the efforts of Palestinian factions so they can regain unequivocal Palestinian rights. Al-Sharat voiced these statements after meeting with the head of Hamas's political office, Khaled Mishal, and other political members of the movement. They discussed the Palestinian situation, considering the current challenges and ongoing 
ongoing efforts to strengthen Palestinian national unity. Michel praised Syria's role in supporting Palestinian unity and resistance against Israeli aggression and attacks on the rights of the Palestinian people and on holy Christian and Muslim sites. The assistant to the Syrian vice president, Mohammed Nassif, attended the meetings. In a press conference, Michel said that his talks with al Shara were focused on the Palestinian situation, especially after Israeli forces attacked Gaza in an attempt to derail Palestinian efforts for reconciliation. We are careful and insist on creating a suitable environment and providing the necessary requirements for a successful Palestinian reconciliation. We are still following up on this and hope that things will move in a positive direction by the 10th of November. Thank you. Seven Palestinians were martyred and many others injured in consecutive raids and aggressions that were launched by the Israeli occupation forces in southern Gaza and Deir al-Bela refugee camp. The latest of these attacks was an air raid that killed one Palestinian and injured others. In response, the Palestinian resistance launched 40 missiles against Israeli occupation targets. Palestinian resistance factions launched missiles against targets across from Gaza in response to the act of aggression launched by the Israeli occupation against Gaza, which killed six resistance fighters and injured seven others. Palestinian factions confirmed that attacking occupation targets is a natural response to the aggression and said that the resistance will continue as long as the aggression continues. We say that this is a blatant violation against the truce. It is a blatant attack on our territories and people. What the Al-Qassam Brigades is doing is a natural response to this heinous crime and defends our nation and land from these crimes and aggressions. Palestinian factions stress that they will put the ceasefire agreement behind them and will consider it irrelevant if such aggression continues. They also said that the occupation wants to take advantage of the fact that the world is preoccupied with the American elections in order to achieve some of its objectives by attacking the Palestinian Arab nation. It's clear that Barack wanted to take advantage of the fact that the international media is preoccupied with American elections in order to strengthen his position in the upcoming Israeli elections. He wants to get rid of the crisis that he's facing at the expense of Palestinian blood and lives. Palestinian leaders called for making the national Palestinian unity and ending internal divisions as a Palestinian priority in response to the Israeli occupation aggression, which seeks to increase tension in the region. This deliberate Israeli provocation is aimed at destroying the ongoing ceasefire. Israel acts in this manner because no one at the international level deters it from doing so. Therefore, it is important to expose the truth about what Israel is doing. Israel is creating tension in the area as a way to frustrate Palestinian national efforts towards unity and force Palestinian factions into violent clashes. The Palestinian response must be to insist on the success of national unity. Israeli occupation forces stopped 20 European envoys from entering Gaza and prevented them from witnessing the living conditions of the Palestinians under Israeli siege and aggression. Israel is taking advantage of the fact that the world is preoccupied with the American elections and has launched this aggression, which is a very dangerous escalation with several objectives in mind. The occupation not only wants to frustrate Palestinian efforts towards dialogue, but Ahud Barak also seeks to strengthen his position in the Israeli elections. Israeli officials often strengthen their positions in elections by carrying out bloody attacks against Palestinians. Yusuf Mahmoud, Syrian Arab Television, Occupied Palestine. أهلا بكم من جديد بدا واضحا أن سياسة المحاور التي ينتهجها سياسة لبنان منذ أكثر من ثلاث سنوات كانت تتفاعل مع تفاصيل الانتخابات الأمريكية. It seems that the policy of polarization in Lebanon, which has existed for the past three years, was influenced by the American elections. It seems as though the United States elections were not only a battle between Obama and McCain, but also between the Lebanese government and the opposition. The Lebanese followed the details of the American elections. The United States Embassy in Lebanon 
Lebanon even invited the Lebanese parliament, ministers and journalists to follow the United States elections at the embassy's headquarters in Oker near Beirut. انتهى المسلسل الامريكي الطويل واصبح باراك اوباما رئيسا للولايات المتحده الامريكيه في انتخابات The long dramatic American episode has finally ended and Obama will now become the new president of the United States. The election was not only an American event but also an international one. After all, America interferes with matters all over the world. With great interest, the Middle East followed these elections which affect its future for the next four years and determine if there will be war or peace. Most Lebanese people welcomed Obama's victory, not for any tangible reason but rather because he called for a change from the Bush regime. which only brought wars and woes. ويرى اللبنانيون أن أوباما بما يحمل من جذور متنوعة وشعارات تدعو للحوار مع العالم العربي والإسلامي فهذا سيمكن أمريكا Obama's interracial heritage and his calls for dialogue with the Arab and Islamic world will enable America to have a different and more practical policy towards the Middle East Of course, this is not guaranteed After all, it seems as though Obama was almost willing to convert to Judaism as a way to convince pro-Zionist media in America to support him However, it is not shameful to dream. Pertaining to Obama's policy towards Lebanon, it is not believed that it will be much different from that of President Bush. Washington will continue to support Lebanon and its independence from Syria, and it will demand that Hezbollah be disarmed. وثمت في لبنان من لا يزال يحتفظ ببعض العقلانية ويرى أن البلد الصغير لن يكون أصلا على جدول أعمال أوباما. However, some knowledgeable Lebanese say that the small country of Lebanon will not be on Obama's busy agenda. He will be preoccupied with Bush's inheritance, which includes many economic problems and foreign challenges. The rules of the game will not change unless Lebanon becomes a field for extremism and terrorism. Obama may also give Lebanon more attention if he decides to use the country to settle scores with Syria and Iran before engaging in dialogue with them. In any case, Lebanon is waiting for Obama to specify his foreign policy. We will cross that bridge when we come to it. There is an American desire to change U.S. relations with different entities in the region. For example, there is a desire to establish dialogue with Iran, Syria, and other forces that the Bush administration considers enemies, such as Hezbollah and Hamas. We think that the policies of the new American administration will create calm in Lebanon. Of course, the American administration will not withdraw from Lebanon in the region, but it will establish a partnership with the March 7th coalition, which has created a new reality in Lebanon and the region. The president will change, but U.S. priorities and the U.S. view of the Middle East will not. The Lebanese, however, are expecting change from a black president and hope that he will not make empty promises like his predecessor, President Bush, did. They hope that he will seriously work to strengthen Lebanon's army. They also hope that the U.S. will not make a deal with Syria that would return Syrian military forces to Lebanon. The Lebanese have high hopes for Obama. If Obama does disappoint them, it might be of little consequence, as those already wet don't worry about the rain. For Al Madar program, Allah Al Mala, Abu Dhabi, Beirut. President-elect Barack Obama got to work immediately today to start forming his administration. His first appointment, White House Chief of Staff, was given to a House Democrat whose father is Israeli and was a member of the Ergun pre-state underground. IBA's Ellie Walkalanter has the details. U.S. President-elect Barack Obama began building his transition team today, a little more than a day after securing an historic election victory. His first pick is his chief of staff, Rahm Emanuel, whose father is an Israeli who fought for the Irgun during the War of Independence. Emanuel is named after any good member who died in action. His parents met in Chicago after the older Emanuel moved there from Israel in the 1960s. Emanuel was active in the Oslo negotiations and choreographed the Rabin Arafat handshake at the White House in September 1993. I'm honored even to be considered. I'm honored, as I said, to be re-elected. 
Those are uptown choices. This is not a professional choice. This is a personal choice about what my wife and I and have to do for our family as much as what I want to do with my career. Meanwhile, Obama has begun discussions on naming his cabinet, and there is wide speculation on who will get the major posts. Former presidential candidate Senator John Kerry has been cited as a frontrunner for the position of Secretary of State. Obama has also mentioned Senator Richard Lugar of Indiana as someone who has shaped his ideas on foreign policy issues. Another name frequently cited is Bill Richardson, the governor of New Mexico and former Democratic presidential candidate. Filling out his economic team will also be a top priority for Obama as he begins to implement the strategy to quell the economic crisis. Said one political analyst, this is one of the first times that I can remember that the Secretary of the Treasury is going to be almost as important as the Secretary of State. Names circulating for Secretary of the Treasury include former Secretary Lauren Summers and Paul Volcker, a former chairman of the Federal Reserve. Other reports in American media are saying that Obama was considering appointing two Kennedys as part of his cabinet. Caroline Kennedy as U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations and Robert Kennedy Jr. as Environment Secretary. Obama will receive his first intelligence briefing as president-elect today as the first-term senator prepares to face security challenges from terrorism to a resurgent Russia. Ellie Wall-Galanter, IBA News. And joining us now in the studio is Jerusalem Post Editor-in-Chief David Horowitz. And David, welcome. Thank you. Interesting election indeed. You uh, had a one-on-one -on -one interview with Barack Obama when he was here a few months ago. Uh, I read a report from a Kremlin analyst yesterday who says Moscow really, uh, Obama is an unknown to Moscow. He's an unknown to America, I think, also and to Israel. What were, you, what were your impressions? Uh, it was in July, and it was, uh, it was only about 15 minutes, uh, but it was one-on-one, -on -one, and uh, you cannot but uh, be impressed by his grasp of the issues. He's very, very smart, uh, incredibly confident. I mean, the, the qualities that, that gave him this impossible, improbable uh, victory. Um, I was struck by the fact that in his, it was only his second visit to Israel. He'd been here for two or three days um, on a previous trip, and then just one day. He did the interview one-on-one. -on -one. He didn't have advisors with him, although Dennis Ross and Dan Kurtz were outside in the corridor. In contrast, when McCain was here, he brought Joe Lieberman to an interview, and uh, President Bush in interviews you know, had, had three, four, five advisors in the room. Obama was one-on-one, -on -one, um, robust on Iran, yes, tough diplomacy to convey to them that he will not uh, tolerate their nuclear program. Uh, if they don't respond uh, uh, constructively to diplomacy, then other options are all on the table. Now we get to see whether, whether that, that's really the case, whether he is that uh, um, firm. On the Israeli-Palestinian front, uh, I thought he, he was um, uh, strikingly um, specific. I asked him about um, religious, historical security claims in Judea and Samaria, uh, and does he view Israel in, in the sort of vision of 67 plus? Uh, and he said, uh, if Israel wants that buffer zone, uh, for its security purposes, you know, that's uh, something that Israel, Israel may require. It needs to think about the antagonism this might cause on the other side. Now, considering that this was a, a visit to Israel where he was really looking not to make enemies, uh, I thought it was interesting that he would make that kind of firm uh, position. David, uh, Wall Street and the international markets, they didn't respond with great enthusiasm to the election of Barack Obama. In fact, there were sharp drops. Isn't there a real danger that the euphoria, especially among the young, the Hispanics, the Afro-Americans, will quickly turn into frustration and even anger if, if change doesn't come and come right now, like he's promised? Look, I think the expectations are astonishing because, you know, he has, he has uh, um, cultivated uh, almost a, a, a rock star, uh, um, uh, cult, uh, the, the, the passion that he has attracted. The United States says it's presented Iraq with the final text of a pact allowing American forces to stay in the country beyond the year, beyond the end of the year. But Baghdad wants more talks on the matter despite almost a year of negotiations. The Iraqi government says the United States has accepted some of the changes it wants, but not others, meaning further talks are needed. Iraq's foreign minister says he wants a deal to be agreed before President Bush leaves office. I'm sure the President Bush administration is... Uh briefing the new administration, the new incoming administration to the White House.
we as the Iraqi government also have been in touch with uh, President-elect uh, Barack Obama's campaign, and we've been briefing them also on the status of our discussions and talks. And uh, therefore, both administrations are fully aware of where we are. But our intention is to uh, analyze this agreement under the current administration, under President Bush. The Iraqi Minister of Immigration and Displacement, Dr. Abed Samad Rahman Sultan, said that his ministry is drafting a measure to attract Iraqi intellectuals who were forced to immigrate outside Iraq. Sultan added that the Iraqi government is doing everything in its power to prepare the best possible atmosphere for the refugees. <laughs> We're asking Iraq's intellectual minds, which have left the country or was forced to flee in the aftermath of the collapse of the former regime, to return home. We are offering incentives to all displaced Iraqi intellectuals. We have established a center in the Ministry of Immigration and Displacement to handle the affairs of the displaced intellectuals. The center, which was given the name the Center for Displaced Iraqi Intellectuals, is in charge of looking after the affairs of returnees. The ministry will pay for all transportation expenses incurred by Iraqi intellectuals while traveling between home and work. We're also offering Iraqi intellectuals 5 million Iraqi dinars in addition to other incentives. Meanwhile, displaced Christian families continue to return to their places of residence in the city of Mosul. This news comes after the Iraqi Authority took additional security measures to ensure the safe return of the displaced families. The families expressed gratitude to the Iraqi National Unity Government, which has contributed to their return, for its concern and support. The Iraqi Minister of Immigration and Displacement announced that his ministry has begun to distribute a government grant to displaced Christian families. The grant was ordered by the Honorable Prime Minister of Iraq, Nouri al-Maliki. The grant is estimated at 1.5 billion Iraqi dinars and is being distributed to nearly 1,884 Christian families who were displaced in and around Nineveh province. We have subsidized displaced Christian families with nearly 1.5 billion Iraqi dinars. Each family is expected to get nearly 300,000 dinars. Today we have begun to distribute the grant, which was ordered by His Honor, the Prime Minister of Iraq. We have started to distribute the grant to families displaced in the areas of Hamdaniya and in other districts. The Iraqi central government also promised to compensate displaced Christian families for their losses once they return to their homes. The Iraqi government and the Ministry of Immigration and Displacement are urging displaced Christian families to return to their homes. There's nearly one million Iraqi dinars awaiting these families once they return. We are hopeful that these families will return to their homes. God willing, there's a good indication that Ninawa has been declared secure, as confirmed by the command center and the operation room in the province. In fact, some displaced families have already returned to their homes in Ninawa. The Iraqi government has taken a clear position towards the displaced Christian families which fled the city of Mosul. The central government is continuing to support these families and work diligently to provide them with security so they can return to their original neighborhoods. Kais Majidi, Iraqia, Mosul. Sudanese newspapers have suspended publication in protest against what has been called a security censorship, which entails reviewing the contents of newspapers prior to publication for approval or confiscation.
Mouths that cannot speak, stomachs that cannot taste, and pens that cannot write. The drawn-out battle of words between the authorities and the press in Sudan is escalating. The Ashras al hurriya daily, linked to the Sudan's People's Liberation Movement, took decisive steps. It was joined by the Maidan daily, which is the voice for the Sudanese Communist Party, and the Raya al Shab daily of the Popular Congress Party. They will suspend publication for three days and will go on a hunger strike today. They are protesting against what has been called preemptive censorship by the security agencies. A group of journalists and writers decided to escalate their battle against the censorship. This goes against the Constitution and the demands of the current political situation. The country is going through the most dangerous and complicated phases. This requires wide, deep and free dialogue. A number of prominent Sudanese news columnists expressed solidarity with this move by deciding to refrain from writing their regular articles for the same duration of time. In solidarity with Address al Huriya daily, a number of journalists writing for various newspapers in Khartoum have announced that we will not write our columns for three days. The security agencies always explains its procedures by saying that there are red lines that cannot be crossed. It says that this is to preserve the cohesion of national building blocks and avoid the country falling into partisan and tribal strife. The partner of the national coalition government clarified its position, saying that he will raise the issue at the highest level. As the head of the People's Liberation Movement Political Bureau and the National Council in the Parliament, I have brought up these issues several times. We will raise these issues at the highest level possible, including the presidency of the Republic. The pencils have desisted from writing and the papers have been suspended. Meanwhile, many people in the royal court believe the country is in dire need of expediting the steps towards passing the journalism and press law. This has been delayed for too long under the dome of the Parliament, which promised to pass it during its current term. Pakistan now. Rights activists have revealed that the CIA, together with Pakistan's intelligence agencies, run around 300 secret detention centers in Pakistan. A victim and rights activist, Amna Massoud, says that the CIA has transported a large number of prisoners to its largest network of torture cells in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Detainees' families are upset with the new Pakistani government for failing to free many of its own nationals from U.S. custody. How much money do we have to arrange? We are talking about nearly 12,000 people. Everyone was abducted for three to four years. According to the rights group, some 20,000 Pakistani nationals are illegally kept in custody in the country. Thousands of Pakistanis missing are suspected to be kept at those dissension centers. Some 5,000 of the detainees are from tribal areas. The rights activists say Pakistani intelligence agencies kidnap two to three locals every day. Well, Pakistani jets have pounded suspected Taliban militant hideouts in the country's northwestern tribal region. At least 17 people have been killed in the raid and the death toll is expected to rise. The jets targeted the town of Mahmud and Nawagai, where local forces have been fighting Taliban and Al-Qaeda militants. The raid comes a day after similar raids on Bajaur killed 15 suspected Taliban militants. Pakistan's Prime Minister Yusuf Reza Gilani has urged the U.S. to share intelligence with local officials but leave the hunt down to Pakistani forces. Gilani's comments come following several U.S. cross-border strikes into Pakistani soil over the past three months. Gilani has warned that such attacks could risk losing the war against the militants. Top U.S. commander David Petraeus says airstrikes have killed three of the top 20 extremists. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org slash mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic intelligence report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East.
The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program was brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. television network devoted to global and national news with uncompromising documentaries and diverse cultural programs. Programs which connect you to the world.